and welcome to the program today. I'm Layo Olarinde. The Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting has officially opened in Rwanda's capital, Kigali. The host, President Paul Kagame, who takes over chairmanship of the 54-nation group that represents a third of the world's population, Rwanda. said it is values that define its membership. These include good governance, rule of law, and protection of rights. Hosting the event had brought his own government the under sharp General criticism the over its human rights record. He said the country had come a long way since the genocide of 1994, in which more than 800,000 people were killed. Much of the Commonwealth brings together countries that were part of the British Empire, but has increasingly included others like Rwanda. Gabon, which is a former French colony, is also set to be admitted to the body during this meeting. I now meeting. invite you all to stand as we welcome. We join together to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen, the head of the Commonwealth, and its most devoted champion. Over her 70 years of service, the Commonwealth has grown both in number and in the scope of its ambition. In the meantime, Prince Charles has told Commonwealth leaders he cannot describe the depths of his personal sorrow at the suffering that was caused by the slave trade. Speaking in Rwanda, he said the potential of the family of nations could only be realized by acknowledging the wrongs that had shaped the past. Prince Charles, who is representing the Queen at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Chogham, described how he was on a personal journey of discovering and is continuing to deepen his own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. Prince Charles added it was up to the states to decide if they remained monarchies or became republics in the future. He also met uh, with Prime Minister after reports uh, he had criticized the UK's Rwanda asylum plan. Some 54 countries are members of the Commonwealth, of which the Queen is the head. For while we strive together for peace, prosperity and democracy, I want to acknowledge that the roots of our contemporary association run deep into the most painful period of our history. I cannot describe the depths of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many as I continue to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. If we are to forge a common future that benefits all our citizens, we too must find ways, new ways, to acknowledge our past. Quite simply, this is a conversation whose time has come. To achieve this potential good, however, and to unlock the power of our common future, we must also acknowledge the wrongs which have shaped our past. Many of those wrongs belong to an earlier age with different and, in some ways, lesser values. By working together, we are building a new and enduring friendship. In Canada recently, my wife and I were deeply touched to meet many of those engaged in the ongoing process of reconciliation. Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples reflecting honestly and openly on one of the darkest aspects of history. The Commonwealth contains within it countries that have had constitutional relationships with my family, some that continue to do so, and increasingly those that have had none. I want to say clearly, as I have said before, that each member's constitutional arrangement as republic or monarchy is purely a matter for each member country to decide. Well,
away from Rwanda, the Tigray's People Liberation Front, which controls the northern Tigray region in Ethiopia, has denied claims by the Ethiopian government that it is preventing aircraft carrying aid from landing at the airport in the regional capital, Mekele. TPLF spokesperson Gechachur Reda said in a statement posted on social media that the group had run out of fuel to operate the airport and accused the government of continuing to enforce a near total ban on the entry of fuel there. Mr. Getachu says the authorities in Addis are blowing the problem out of proportion in order to deflect attention away from the carnage and generated crisis that is claiming the lives of thousands of people in Oromia, Gambela, Benin Shango, Guzum, and other parts of the country. In a statement, the government communication service, GCS, accused the TPLF of preventing aid planes from landing at the airport. The government said the daily supply of medicines, medical supplies, and nutritious food for children that it was facilitating had first been suspended indefinitely. On Monday, the European Union asked Ethiopia to open an additional corridor to deliver more humanitarian aid to Tigray. The United Nations World Food Programme, WFP, is warning that hunger is tightening its grip on more than 20 million people in Ethiopia who are facing a combination of conflict in the north and climate shocks drought in the south. Dwindling resources mean food and nutrition support may run dry from next month. In northern Ethiopia, 19 months of war have left more than 13 million people in need of humanitarian food assistance, mainly in conflict-affected zones in Afar, Amhara and Tigray regions. People have been severely affected by the conflict. People have been displaced, they've lost everything, people are trying to go back. And this is a very, very crucial moment because people are expecting rain. And if people cannot be in the field, if they cannot dedicate the time, energy, resources to take care of the field, then we are headed towards another disaster. The Interior Ministry in Tunisia has said it has confirmed information that there are serious threats to the life and safety of President Kais Saeed. A ministry spokesperson also said that police forces had, had foiled what was described as a terrorist attack on Thursday. Well, the announcement comes as Mr. Saeed continues to rule effectively by decree with a referendum scheduled next month on a new constitution that his opponents say will further strengthen his powers. In the meantime, police in Tunisia have arrested a former Prime Minister, Hamadi Jabali. Well, during his premiership from 2011 to 2013, Mr. Jabali belonged to the Ennada Islamist Party, the largest in parliament, until President Kais Saeed dissolved the assembly and seized executive power in the country last year. Mr. Jabali's lawyer said the former politician had been under recent investigation that his boiler factory in the city of Susa, but could not say why he had been detained. However, his family have denounced this arrest as repressive and say they hold President Said personally responsible for his well-being. Well, back here in Nigeria, the Nigerian Communications Commission is again given assurances that the 5G technology to be rolled out in the next two months will not have any negative impact on health and environment. Well, this is coming from the vice chairman, NCC, Professor Umar Danbata. He made the comments during the 90th edition of Telcom Consumer Parliament in Lagos, where he further reveals that the new technology will improve the country's GDP. On September 8, 2021, the Federal Executive Council approved the national policy on 5G networks for Nigeria's digital economy. The fifth generation mobile networks are emerging technologies that have the potential to significantly enhance the experience with mobile networks and real-time communication. Channels Television went to the streets to ask Nigerians concerning their awareness about the 5G technology. 5G is left to about 100% faster. You would 
see 5G um, really changing the way we live. We'll have, you know, it will be a sci-fi world ultimately by the time 5G is deployed. It's exactly two months to the rollout of 5G technologies in Nigeria. The Nigerian Communications Commission, NCC, is holding the 90th edition of its Telecom Consumer Parliament to create more awareness on the rollout plans. 5G network faced considerable challenges. It's a fact. These challenges include the requirements for more spectrum and vastly more spectrally efficient technologies, more than what the current 3G and 5G systems require. The forum breaks up into panel discussions with operators of mobile phones, regulator agencies, and consumer representatives giving further details about the new technology. The expectations are high, as well as it, uh, the threats are also there. Uh, we cannot lose focus on what happened during the COVID era. It's going to be a lot of action to go around educating our public concerning health effects of all this video activity that comes with it. What are you buying 5G that is going to be like in some of countries have in the world that they have 5G that but it's on 4G effect? Everything is going to be 5G. Following with the development we have, they ensure that the value of full 5G is going to be provided. Some of the issues discussed include rumors about health and environmental impact of 5G technology. All these institutions have carried out research and they have still been doing. And these are some of the very low exposure level. And the research result collected to date, there is no convincing scientific evidence that the weak RF signal from base stations and wireless network cause adverse health effects. In the end, the NCC gives assurances that the new technology will enhance services in different sectors of the economy, such as the healthcare, education, agriculture, transportation, and manufacturing, amongst others. The federal government has committed to setting up more model rehabilitation centers to further reduce the prevalence of drug abuse, uh, drug use among Nigerians. Well, the chairman of the NDLEA, retired Brigadier General Buba Mawa, says that 80% of drug users need counseling and that the agency prioritizes the overall well-being of drug users. He was speaking on Channel TV's hard copy. I'll be the first to, to accept that there's a death of rehab centers. And you have thousands, if not millions, of drug users who need help. But there's nowhere to go. And so they snuck back into their bedrooms and continue to take drugs. But some of the initiatives I know of the federal government, um, right now we have, <clears throat> I believe, just 11 model proper uh, rehab centers in the country, which is very, very low. The PASIDA uh, committee recommended three per state, looking at the prevalence. And the federal government already, through the uh, uh, Ministry of Health, has uh, agreed to build one more rehab center in every state. In all our commands, we have counseling centers, uh, counseling. 80% of the drug users actually need uh, counseling and a little bit of rehab. It's the 20% that are addicted to drug use that need full rehab. So most people think the NDLEA arrests, seizes, and, convict, and tries to convict jailers. But over half of those that we arrest, I must tell you, we send for counseling. 11,000 plus uh, have been counseled from January last year till this moment through our commands. Each of our command has a counseling center with experts in the drug demand uh, units. We have our own template where we determine this is within our capability. Those that we feel uh, above our capability, we send to the rehab centers. So, so in a nutshell, um, I think you ought to know that the NDLA itself does a lot of counseling.
The former president of Angola, Jose Eduardo dos Santos, has been admitted to a hospital in the Spanish city of Barcelona. Portuguese state news agency Lusa reports that Mr. Dos Santos had been hospitalized in an intensive care unit in a hospital in Barcelona where he had resided for the past few years. The report comes amid speculation about the health of the former long-serving leader of the southern African country. Back in May, the 79-year-old ex-president responded to rumors about his death by slamming the contradictory reports, he called it, about his health and pointing out that his personal doctor was the only one authorized to speak on the matter. He served as the president of Angola from 1979 to 2017. Well, more than 400 sub-Saharan African migrants have tried to storm the border of the Spanish enclave of Melilla in Morocco. It's the first such attempted mass crossing into the territory since Madrid and Rabat resumed diplomatic ties back in March. The authorities in Melilla said a significant number of migrants managed to get in. The diplomatic crisis came to an end after Spain supported Morocco's autonomy plan for the disputed region of Western Sahara. Melilla and Quetta have the European Union's only land borders with Africa, making them a magnet for migrants. Lack of maintenance culture over the years has adversely affected sustainable development in Nigeria, especially in the aviation industry. Well, this is the view of Nigerian-American professional airline pilot, Remy Bamishile. According to him, starting from scratch with each successive government pulls the industry many steps backwards, a trend which thwarts efforts to harness the capacity of the aviation sector as a money spinner in terms of tourism. One thing that comes to mind about the Nigerian aviation culture is the maintenance culture. Uh, I think the country could do better in improving its maintenance when it comes to keeping things going, maintaining what they already have instead of starting from scratch all over again. I grew up hearing about the stories of Nigerian Airways and they have fleets of wide body jets flew all over Europe to America, all over Africa. And, you know, those things are nowhere to be found today. I don't even, I didn't get to really witness it, but I've heard stories. And in present day, I've witnessed a company like Arik Airline fly to America, to New York with his A330, A340, fly to London, and today those flights are not existent, even if, even though the airline is still operating. So I think it will go a long way to be conscious about maintaining what is already established instead of trying to reinvent the wheel over and over again. Well, to catch the full interview with Captain Remy Bamishile, do watch Diaspora Network on Saturday at 7.30 p.m. The World Health Organization is set to decide whether to declare monkeypox a global health emergency, staring criticism from leading African scientists who say it has been a crisis in their region for years. The deliberations and scrutiny of the WHO's response to the outbreak follows concerns over how the United Nations Agency and governments worldwide handled COVID-19 in early 2020. A public health emergency of international concern is WHO's highest level of alert. The agency does not declare pandemics, but it did start using the term to describe COVID-19 in March 2020. For many governments, that's rather than WHO's earlier declaration of an emergency in January was the moment they began to take real action to try to contain COVID, which proved to be too late to make a difference. Monkeypox does not spread nearly as easily as COVID and there are vaccines and treatments available, unlike the coronavirus when it's emerged, but the disease has still raised alarm globally. 
BRICS countries are working in solidarity to fulfill their goal of combating COVID-19 by setting up a vaccine center in South Africa, which will offer a strong platform to battle future health crises. Well, this is according to South African President Cyril Ramaphosa. The idea of a BRICS vaccine research and development center was first proposed by South Africa during their chairmanship of BRICS back in 2018. With the support of all member countries, this concept was launched to strengthen global preparedness and responses to future pandemics. Mr. Ramaphosa believes the latest developments of this centre will help further deepen the already strong BRICS relationship. As South Africa, we will also be looking forward to BRICS living up to the commitment that was made to support our vaccination uh, uh, centre. As BRICS, we agreed that South Africa would be the home of the vaccination centre that was going to be put up. So we would want that uh, to, to be something that progresses. And China came in very handy uh, for us as a country during the most dangerous period of COVID, when we didn't have PPEs in large number, we were able to request China. I specifically had a number of engagements with President Xi Jinping, and he was able to open up really wonderful assistance processes. And as we set it up, I spoke uh, to President Xi Jinping and uh, asked him to get Chinese companies to participate in this platform. The platform helped to reduce prices a great deal for PPEs in terms of masks, uh, sanitizers, ventilators, and a number of other medical supplies that we got from China. Having premiered to a sold-out audience at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre in London, Kunene and the King, a new play by acclaimed South African playwright and actor John Canney, is on a nationwide tour on home soil. Well, it's a play that explores race, relations, politics, and the love of Shakespeare. Dr. Webber, nursing agency, I've come to look after well, you. I, I, I'm supposed to believe that. Get out. Get out. I'm going to call the police now. Get out. When retired nursing official Lunga Kunini is sent by his agency to the home of a terminally ill patient, he's mistaken for a robber. Jack Morris has not interacted with black people in the New South Africa and views them with suspicion. This is one of the themes that Tony Award winner Kani explores in this play as South Africa was celebrating 25 years of democracy in 2019. As part of his research, Kani said he then asked his friends what they thought about the new South Africa, and they had different things to say. From this research, Kani got the inspiration to write Kunini and the King. So the play is trying to explore those silent conversations we have, whereby if you appoint a new black person to be the manager of the department, or you appoint a woman for that matter to be the manager of the department, the staff immediately acts differently because it's a woman, or because it's a black person, or because it's a white person, it is those kind of undertones that I'm dealing with. And audiences see themselves, and they learn to be cautious sometimes in their own lives, to be clear about other things, and to be sensitive to the feelings of other people on the other side. There was in high school, one of our set works was Julius Caesar. I like that play. The issues explored in the play are how the black people who were wronged by the apartheid government set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and yet they are the ones who needed to be forgiven. I told you the death of the place by eight. It's only seven but is the love for William Shakespeare that unites them? But is it the love too? But is it the love for William Shakespeare that unites them? South African actor Michael Richard plays actor Jack Morris. In the play, King Lear himself, the character, the king is very, he doesn't understand his people. He doesn't understand the beggars. He doesn't understand the poor people. He has no humanity. And Lear, through his journey and his madness, but, but his, his, he, he learns humanity. He learns, he learns something in, the, in his journey. And in this play, I learn 
The play premiered on the international stage in London in 2019, but its run had to be put on hold due to the pandemic. Patrons who went to see the play at the Johannesburg Theatre say they could relate with what they saw. And one of the things that um, Gunene says to, 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 to Jack is the, is the aspect of, do you see me or do you actually always deal with the, with the nurse, uh, the sister, or are you actually able to see me as the man that I am? And I think that's still something that we still um, are contending with, even in this generation. Uh, basically, the fact that I'm actually a young generation. Right, so it actually gave a paradigm shift in understanding like the politics and the apartheid, what happened in the past. And it's things that we always talk about, but I think today it actually lightened me more in understanding what exactly happened. Do you fear death? After its run in Johannesburg, Kanini and the King will be on tour in Durban and Kobecha, formerly Port Elizabeth. And those and that's it on the program today and for the week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olayunde. Have a lovely weekend.